Uh, first of all, um, welcome again to this, our, uh, our September uh, underwater HOA meeting. As many of you uh, may remember, uh, our very first meeting uh, happened uh, in January of 2019 when then commissioner, current mayoral candidate, uh, Danella Levine Cava uh, had us all, 80 some of us, raise our hands at um, Pinecrest Gardens Hibiscus Gallery and take the oath of membership for the underwater HOA. Um, we did so and in that meeting, I uh, unanimously elected Brian as our chair. And uh, since then, um, the group has created an executive committee that includes uh, Victor and Holly. And those are the, the three leaders of this underwater HOA. We initially met under the, the uh, with the support of the National League of Conservation Voters and the Florida Conservation Voters who uh, loved the concept of underwater HOA as something that they could use to promulgate their message of advocacy across the state. Uh, and uh, in time, um, uh, decided to go in a little bit of a different direction because their work is pure advocacy while, while ours is about uh, building community and literally having homeowners learn together and work together. And that's where we were as we met, again, under Brian's leadership um, at Hibiscus and then at Books and Books, and then decided to come back to Hibiscus where we were not just having meetings, but also doing some hand painted signs for us to distribute in the community. And of course the pandemic happened and we've been online since. So this is yet another underwater HOA meeting that we have online. And I really, really, really can't wait for us to come back and meet in person. I think there's something really powerful about doing it in an organic way where we get to introduce ourselves to one another, where we can get to network on the side and where ideas can percolate. Adam, who's the director of Cortado Projects, where the group is based, has created these two meeting rooms where Brian will lead one group where we try to operate as a homeowners group in a chat, in a, in a Zoom breakout room. And Adam, uh, who's a full-time uh, uh, employee over at Cortado Projects, is going to be leading an engagement group. And I really encourage all of us to stay afterwards so that we could at least create some sort of fellowship there uh, and, and generate ideas and, and engage in action. Importantly though, I think most importantly, um, in the past few months, we've done important things like respond to the back bay study. Uh, Brian and I co-authored a letter there. I wanna thank uh, Jamal and, uh, for helping us with that. Uh, Jamal, Adam and I have been speaking so much about uh, doing stuff within our website to really uh, strengthen it as a, as a resource page that uh, we can use uh, to mobilize. But the really one message I wanna give all of us today is that your last day to register to vote is October 5th, and the last day to get a mail-in ballot is October 1st. And nothing we do here <laughs> matters more than voting. We're in a nonpartisan group. In fact, we're not even an official group. You're operating out of an artist's studio and webcam. <laughs> but we behave as if we were uh, a 501c3 group. We're not partisan, but the election of who gets to manage this county, who gets to oversee Miami-Dade County strong mayor form of government, a form of government that um, is so powerful that it has its own home rule charter and uh, its mayor is the second most powerful person in Florida. You could argue uh, she, or he would be the fourth most powerful, but definitely uh, it's the governor, speaker, and president of the Senate who control those chambers in full, and they're both partisan chambers, which means they speak to the opposite, to the extremes, not to the center. And then the mayor of Miami, the state of Florida's most, uh, you know, uh, largest metropolitan area, the regional mayor, the one that controls the seaports, the airports, you know, literally the billions of dollars of this community, literally will have a say in what happens. And I wanna to speak to, to, to us as a group on November 4th after election day. And I think my, my theme is gonna be now what? Uh -huh. 
And it's now what, whether an environmentalist gets elected, because an environmentalist will need the support of a brand new commission chamber, because more than half of our commission chamber is also gonna be newly elected, which means everything we wanna do for homeowners in Florida for the next four, five decades, really depends on who sits on that dais now, because once you get in, it's hard to get you out. And if the wrong person gets elected, then we still need to double our forces to make sure that that happens. So all I'm trying to say is October 5th, please vote. I'm gonna put a link here on the website where you can register to vote. Um, October 1st, last moment you have to get your mail-in ballot. And if you do nothing else, right, for the homeowners group, for the future of your families, for what we're gonna do with sea level rise in South Florida, what's gonna to happen to our ecology or environmental degradation, just know who you're voting for and make sure you vote. That's my only wish out of this meeting. I also wanna do something we don't normally do, but I, I am sort of feeling like this is a long-term process of meeting like this, Brian. And Brian, I'd just like you to start the meeting with just having folks just introduce themselves. And I really mean for 10 seconds, just your name, where you live, and maybe that's it. Like, you know, like really, really short, but just unmute themselves because I want people's faces to pop up. Normally we're just giving a meeting and it, I, I'm sort of feeling that we're losing our sense of community. So if, Brian, if you can lead the meeting with that and then introduce Hunter, I think that'd be really awesome. Okay. Sure, I think that's a great idea, Xavier, because uh, like those of us that have been around for a while and came to the meetings or been coming to the meetings know that a lot of this was, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about each other's personal reasons for coming and what our motivations were. And, and as, as Xavier mentioned, we maybe are not, we're not engaging in that way as much this way. So anyway, I'm Brian House. I'm the, the chair of the Underwater HOA. And um, I, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, next person, I guess we'll just, uh, I, I mean, obviously my screen is different than everybody else's screen. So what did so you call I guess, it out, Brian? I think all right, I'll call you out. I got your names here. So uh, Adam, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Adam Roberti. I'm the director of Cortada Projects, and I live uh, in Miami, city of Miami, uh, about 10 minutes from the UM campus. And Jamal, we'll go through our... Uh, hello, um, I'm Jamal Wilson. I'm the uh, coordinator intern for Cortada Projects Underwater HOA. Could and, I get... um, hello. Keep going, Jamal. And um, I was born and raised uh, here in Miami, Florida, and a proud hurricane. <laughs> okay, Carl, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm going to go in my, so I don't get confused and miss anybody. I'm just going now and break down my screen, so. Sure, thanks, Brian. I'm Carl Brent. I live in Coconut Grove, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Grove Carbon, a new startup in Miami to, uh, to try and help what we're all trying to do. Um, Save the Planet. Um, I was introduced to Xavier through the Clear Institute's symposium uh, last year and, um, and just love what um, Cordata Projects does. So I'm just passionate to be part of the group. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, that was Molly, right, I said, Molly Dixie. Hi, I'm Molly. I live in Pinecrest. I'm actually a friend of Adam from grad school and really excited to join your meeting. Thanks, Molly. Okay, now I have the Cilia and uh, Nicole. Yeah, they're going to call my name. Hi, uh, I'm Cilia. I am an undergrad at UM, a senior, actually taking uh, Xavier's class this semester. Um, and I live in Brickell. Hi, um, I'm Nicole, and I also live in Brickell, and I'm a recent grad from UN. Nice to meet you both. Uh, Deanna? Hi, I'm Deanna. I'm from North Carolina, but I'm an undergrad at UN, finishing my last semester, and I actually interned with Cortada Projects this past summer. Oh, great. Um, you, uh, the gentleman who was on an iPhone, I don't see your name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, all the more reason to introduce yourself. 
Oh, hi. My name is Ralph Raposo, and I live in the East Kendall area near Baptist. And um, I just wanted to get more informed on the rising waters and what's going on with that. Um, so that's why I joined. So Thank you. My, Thank my you. wife. Pleasure is to have you, Ralph. Yeah, what's that? Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm, oh, I'm thank the, you. The... Um, Hunter, our speaker for today. <laughs> Sorry, I figured I would just talk about myself okay. when I actually talk. But yes, hi, I'm Hunter Vaughn. Uh, I'm the Environmental Media Scholar in Residence at the University of Colorado, Colorado, Colorado Boulder. Uh, I was lucky enough to be on sabbatical down in Miami when uh, Dr. Meryl Shriver Rice, my partner, launched the new Environment, Culture, and Media Master's Program uh, at the Abbas Center uh, for Ecosystem Science and Policy at UM. And so I helped to teach for that and to develop that. And now I am quarantining and teaching remotely in Colorado from Coconut Grove, where I am a renter. If that matters for this, I don't know. But it I guess I have to go in the other the the engagement group or something. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter at all. That that is uh, that is not a criterion we are employing in any way, shape, or form. So absolutely does not matter whether you rent, own, believe in private property, think that we should have complete uh, economic redistribution, all of it. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we'll move along. Thank you, and we'll get back to you in a few. Uh, Inigo. Hey guys, my name is Inigo Martinez. Um, I live in Key Biscayne and I'm an artist as well. Um, also very focused on the environment. Uh, so yeah, great to meet you guys. Thanks Inigo. I think Brian is dealing with a pet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I apologize for that. You all, I have an older dog that is a constant thorn in my Zooming not much I can do about that. Um, okay, continuing along, Kristen, Marcel. Hi, everyone. I am in Washington State. So I hope that it's okay that I join you today. I'm the new director of the Climigration Network. And we are a network of people, both people with lived experience and practitioners that are trying to find ways to help communities like yours. And so I'm working with uh, Xavier and Jamal and um, trying to better understand what you're all struggling with and how we can do a better job of serving communities like yours. So I respectfully ask for permission to join your, your meeting today. Well, of course. Uh, that, that is perfectly uh, acceptable. We welcome you. Victor, Victor is one of our, our board members and uh, look forward to hearing from him. Brian, I see you with that backdrop. I expect that when you turned around, you're going to grab a rod and reel and bring a fish in. <laughs> yeah, the, the real scream. <laughs> so my name is Victor Vincent. Uh, I am a homeowner in Palmetto Bay, so I'm very interested in the aspects about the homeowner part of our association. Um, <clears throat> I worked with Xavier on a number of projects over a shockingly large number of years. And uh, I'm a museum and attractions uh, consultant and professional. I've worked with a number of the institutions here. Presently, I serve as the curator for the Gold Coast Railroad Museum by the zoo. Oh. Interesting. That is something I didn't know about you. I guess we'll, we should have everybody bring in one of those uh, Next time we have an icebreaker or something else you didn't know about to everybody. Right? I'm, I'm telling you, Brian, I've got a really nice um, restored 1950s railroad bar and restaurant car that we can, once we get past all this COVID stuff, we want to have kind of an interesting meeting. We can go meet at the Railroad Museum one evening. Great. Sounds good. Brittany. <laughs> it's a test. Yep, you're good. Yeah. Oh, you're not good. <laughs> not hearing you. Um, so Brittany's actually one of my longtime best friends. And Brittany, I don't know if you can uh, speak right now, so I'll just introduce you. Uh, she lives in Tallahassee, um, and so she's joining us from afar. But Brittany, thank you for being here. And if you can get your mic to work later, you can give a little more info about yourself. 
Yeah, type, type it in the chat. You can chat it as well, yeah. Uh, Livio. Hello. My name, my name is Livio, and uh, I'm a web developer. I'm also a civic technologist. That means is that uh, I build uh, technology-based services for the public, and uh, I've been working with Xavier and a number. Xavier and Adam, I've had the big pleasure of working with them on a number of projects in the last half a year. So happy to be here and get to know everyone else. Pleasure to meet you. Christina. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Christina. I'm actually Sila's mother. Uh, so we all live in Brickell together. We've been Miamians for about three years, but I had already heard of Xavier Cortada's project, um, the one with the signs in front of the houses. I tend to like artist-led initiatives, especially when they're social, cultural, and global in nature. I've already participated in at least one or two of those meetings, and I'm really interested in what you're doing and how this is going to evolve and also seeing that there's people from other states who are joining this. Thank you, Christina. Uh, pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Claudio? Okay. Claudio may be fixing a snack here or something. We'll, we'll see. Uh, Holly, you're the last, but certainly not the least. So uh, we uh, welcome another, our other board member on the call here, Holly Zickler. Hmm. Holly may also be getting us there. This was going so smoothly. I wonder if something is uh, something has happened here. <laughs> well, now oh, maybe okay. the. Uh, Hi, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Sorry. I, I, I just have you on my phone. I'm just running late for dinner. So, um, uh, or, or making dinner. Um, anyway, so um, I am Holly Zickler and uh, I live in South Miami. I am part of a, well, okay. Uh, let's see. I teach architecture to first year um, at FIU. And um, so, you know, so I take my, my responsibility is seriously there. Um, I'm also a community member in um, South Miami um, and have been part of a community group that um, is really trying to make South Miami better. So I take my responsibilities uh, seriously there as well. And um, our uh, sea level rise resiliency uh, is an important factor in the health of our community. So that's why I'm here and why I have been here for a long time and where, you know, the activism um, of both our community members, um, it basically it's, it's, it's all important. So that's why, sorry. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Thanks to everybody. And um, I was beginning to suspect that the Miami-Dade hackers had turned their attention to us, but apparently not. So, um, the uh, so, uh, right now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, and many of you know Hunter better than I, but I will nonetheless do the duty of uh, inter introducing him. It was a great pleasure, Hunter, um, and I, I look forward to hearing what you, you have to say today. Um, Hunter Vaughn is a cultural historian and an environmental media scholar, and he focuses on the relationship between the media, social power, and the environment. And he's, as he mentioned, a scholar in residence in Miami at the University of Colorado, an interesting twist there. Um, and is the, uh, and is the principal investigator on a grant to build a global green media production network to facilitate and support environmentally responsible film and media production initiatives around the world. He's the founder and, and, and editor of um, so, and, uh, media related to environmental studies, social justice and science commission communication through the prism of screen media. So it's a great pleasure to have him here to speak today and I, um, yeah, Hunter, do you want to, ready to take it away? 
Sure thing. Uh, thanks, Brian. And thanks, Adam and Jamal for, for putting this together and Xavier for bringing us all together and, and all of you for being here. Um, can I just share my screen and sort of roll with it from there? Yep, you're welcome to. Okay. All right, can you all see the, is it all good? You can yep. see, it. okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm here today to talk about, Brian you know, introduced a good amount of what I do. I work on largely the material infrastructure and the material impacts and environmental consequences, resource use, waste production of uh, mainly of digital culture, but screen culture in general. And so I'll give you a bit of my background in a minute, uh, just to contextualize what I'm talking about today. But the focus of today is really what I have turned um, more centrally to look at over the past couple of years, which is the environmental impacts and resource dependency in our digital and online culture or our digital online culture. Um, and I have definitely gotten used to over the past couple of months as classes have started again, and this is largely what I teach as well, simply acknowledging that this is the pandemic edition version uh, of a talk that I have given <laughs> quite a few times, but have never or have not yet really had the opportunity uh, to speak about in the context of this highly divisive uh, political moment that uh, we're in, we're all stuck in our houses, we're all stuck to our screens, dependency uh, on online interactions and communications and forms of information exchange is all the more heightened. And I think that this has more than ever actually you know, revealed some of the fissures of social inequality, environmental injustice uh, that are at the heart of digital culture, which has long sold itself as being both immaterial and democratizing, uh, which are not necessarily true. Um, I didn't actually realize that this was a nonpartisan group. I, I might not have come if I knew that. Uh, so I'm, I apologize in advance if I offend anyone uh, through implicit uh, political uh, alliances of the, or anything of the sort. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's really important, uh, and this is, I stress this with my students, with my colleagues, with my research partners, with everyone, like, we just can't ignore the fact that we're living in the midst of a crazy moment and that this crazy moment is, is linked to two major paradigms, and those are digital culture and environmental health. And the pan pandemic on a, on a health scale is related to so many things that are related to climate change and environmental justice, while at the same time, again, it's deepening the, the power and the, the hegemony of, of big tech uh, as we move forward, as you see that while you know 10, over 10 million people go unemployed, Jeff Bezos makes like $14 billion in a day. And while New York is still quarantined, they're asking former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, to help them with their post-pandemic recovery as a smart city, building it as a smart city based on algorithmic uh, and, and data sensing technologies. So I really think that this is a moment, if it wasn't already abundantly clear, the connection between these things, uh, where we need to start considering them. Normally, I, I also start classes, talks, and presentations with what is called a land acknowledgement, which acknowledges wherever we are was probably stolen from someone and that there were indigenous peoples that lived there. And I imagine that since we're all in different remote places, maybe each of us can internalize or think about our relative land acknowledgement wherever we are and have converted this now into what I call a virtual material, materiality acknowledgement. Uh, which simply acknowledges that this digital form of communication that we're using from my laptop to yours or your phone or your iPad uh, is not existing on some ethereal cloud uh, as big tech has convinced us or has, has sort of sold an illusion to us, but is part of this massive material infrastructure that itself is highly dependent on the resourcing or the, the mining of, of precious metals, the constant dependency on largely dirty power grids and the production of both greenhouse gases that help to contribute to climate change, as well as e-waste that's part of this global chain of imperialism and inequality. 
Um, so I think that all of these are, are really important aspects to consider. N now, I, I, I acknowledge that I am using this same technology. I'm using the same form of technological of communications technology. So there's kind of um, a catch-22 to the way that we're forced to meet up and, and hold some form of, of community today. Uh, but we do the best with what we have and hopefully we arrive at a more culturally conscientious, socially just and environmentally uh, responsible way of doing that. Um, so yeah, so when I talk about digital culture, online culture being part of this larger material infrastructure, and I'm going to talk quite, you know, on a large umbrella scale about that issue, and then I'm going to bring it back in to, to more specific issues that might be localized uh, for people in South Florida and in Miami. You know, all of this has an extremely long cradle to cradle lifespan. Um, our digital communications, our digital text, and our digital hardware and, and technologies and machinery devices uh, that really begins in the mining of precious metals and for at least the two, most of the 2000s, uh, late 90s and early 2000s, while companies like Apple and Dell were really getting uh, rich and extremely, you know, entrenched as industrial entities, they were relying on the production of coltan, which is a precious metal that helps, helps our processors and um, semiconductors move more quickly. It's why our information moves quickly, basically. It's why computers are so powerful, uh, which was coming from uh, mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where mostly child labor under guerrilla uh, army surveillance was mining these, uh, these metals in very labor and environmentally irresponsible ways, selling them to these massive multinational corporations. And then the proceeds were helping to fund a series of civil wars uh, in the nations surrounding the Congo. Um, all of that through the infrastructures of uh, fiber optic cables snaking our ocean floors to the satellites that revolve um, orbit our planet uh, to the server farms that store all of our and archive all of our our information and then to the digital dumping grounds where our technologies uh, are burned down in order to recycle some of those precious metals uh, where they've been shipped usually to to um, less wealthy countries, India, Ghana, Kenya, where people who are marginalized from those economies endure these extremely um, horrific working conditions filled with carcinogenic pollution that seeps into groundwater, poisons villages. And it's really, you know, that we, we have completely laced our bodies of water, our forests and mountains, as well as the, you know, orbital atmosphere around our planet with the, the debris and the chemical runoff of this amazing uh, cultural revolution, which it absolutely is. You know, we live at a very rare moment, not just because of a pandemic, but we live in the midst of a technological cultural revolution, which happens maybe every 500 years somewhat akin to the, the advent of the printing press at the end of the 1400s and then early 1500s. And so there are marvels to think about ways in which this new media actually gives us new technologies for understanding the environment. Um, and a lot of that has focused on sea level rise in South Florida, a lot of science communication, digital simulations, data visualizations, you know, a lot of this is really fostered by, by digital media. But at the same time, we also have to think about ways into which it plays into larger social power structures, but also uh, cultural waste and, and um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so just a little bit more specifically about me. Um, uh, last year, I came out with a book called Hollywood's Dirtiest Secret, that's sort of a, an environmental counter narrative to the history of Hollywood that looks at some major texts from Gone with the Wind to Avatar as case studies for as entry points for the environmental costs of the movies. Uh, also founded with Dr. Shriver Rice, this journal, the Journal of Environmental Media, which was launched last year. Um, if you haven't heard of it, check it out. We just came out with our second issue and you can find it. Uh, it's, it's from Intellect Press 
And our second issue has a supplement that is open access online. So you can access it all for free. And it's short form articles specific. It's a special issue guest edited on environmental media amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And so there's some really interesting, engaging and progressive thinking in there about ways in which uh, this particular moment is, is really um, both reflecting and in some ways facilitating some of the social and environmental problems or dangers uh, and inequities of, of the digital age. However, I didn't really begin here. Um, I began largely in a more humanities, philosophical, ethical approach uh, to the social ramifications of visual culture. And so my first book looks at how screen uh, forms, in particular moving image arts, can help to deconstruct conventional worldviews and position us in ways that challenge the sort of Cartesian subjective view of a world that over centuries justified slavery, patriarchy, and environmental exploitation. Um, and I gradually turned to an interest specifically in films or, or media texts about the environment, uh, which for me was embodied by a rising popularity in the early 90s, which was when I was a teenager, of a genre that's referred to popularly as eco-cinema uh, now, which really just is a neologism used to refer to ways, uh, to films that are about environmental issues and films that either are feature documentary or fiction films that are conventional approaches to environmental issues or that try to find sort of avant-garde or experimental ways to shift our, our positionality in relation uh, to the rest of the natural world of which we're a part instead of maintaining a sort of culture nature divide uh, that's very problematic. Now I turned away though from issues of how nature is represented and started looking at the actual behind the scenes backstory of uh, major screen media production like film production as a sort of constellation of all of these different natural resource dependencies, um, including uses of energy, uh, yeah, energy reliance, um, chemical use, uses of water, and in the process producing all kinds of greenhouse gas and, and pollutive runoff. Um, it was while I was starting that project actually that, which, which led up to the book that came out last year, that Avatar came out. And um, for those of you, I assume most of you are familiar with Avatar, at least as a phenomenon, even if you haven't seen it. Um, regardless of how one might critique Avatar's narrative as a sort of white male savior uh, fetishization of, of technology and romanticization of the, the noble savage, I think that it's difficult to discredit uh, both the aesthetic uh, quality of the film and what it does with digital technology, but also the role that it's played in shifting uh, mainstream media production entirely from analog practices to digital practices. And Avatar was a film that both built itself as an environmental narrative, but also built itself as a fully digital film. And in some ways that provoked for me a question of whether or not the digital revolution is actually a green revolution. And there are many ways I think in which historically they were aligned. Um, uh, the popularity and the visibility of, of climate change is issues in the 1990s arose largely parallel to the introduction of digital cameras, of digital uh, or nonlinear editing facilities, and from films like Twister through the, in 1995 to The Day After Tomorrow in 2004, to Avatar and to, to blockbuster films today, you know, CGI was largely incorporated more and more as this way to both represent these really captivating, beautiful ecosystems, fictional ecosystems like in Avatar, while also managing to visualize potential threats of climate change. And so there was, seemed to be a way in which there was a specific maybe zeitgeist link between these two movements, um, but they also catered largely to similar demographic audiences. 
Uh, they largely relied on and helped to feed the industrial and economic success of interlinked uh, industrial and econ um, corp corporate entities, uh, as well as particular individual beneficiaries. But as you can see, I mean, this is just one shot from the making of Avatar. Avatar, to call a digital film a fully digital or immaterial ignores the fact that it's largely reliant on actual material objects and that they're usually shot in analog forms. They usually require actual people in actual places and an enormous infrastructure, both of set construction, but also of, of digital production. And so ever since I sort of stumbled through the, I don't know, rabbit hole um, of, of Avatar <laughs> as sort of a mind game um, for an environmental media scholar, I, I've been focusing mostly on this paradox between the, between the digital and the environmental that is consistently or continuously finding new ways to be manipulated both through mainstream cultural discourse, but also I would say through, through scientific mechanisms that show both how digital technology can provide us with new understandings of climate science, for example, and new models for foreshadowing or predicting uh, possible climate strategies or, or, or climate um, resilience strategies or adaptation strategies while at the same time making us a, all the more uh, dependent on, um, on digital technologies for our mediated relationship with the environment. And so for a group that's talking really, I think, as far as I understand it, about locality, about environmental issues uh, in relation to locality, to community, uh, and to the potential interrelationship between between humanity and the rest of the natural world both you know humanity our constructed environments and natural environments all of which are intertwined and not at all separate i think that this problem is you know particularly pertinent today um and maybe i'd be curious also to know which homeowners i don't maybe that's not actually what people here are but uh how the homeowners association uh addresses aspects of digital home existence, such as uses of things like Nest and other smart devices within houses that control our living spaces and not just our information, communication, and entertainment spaces. So I look at you know this historical, as a cultural historian, I'm looking at this evolution from an early 20th century cinematic culture, uh, whereby we all sit together in a space looking at this one image that's projected to us to a televisual culture where we all largely sit in separate spaces, sometimes with family or friends, uh, and have the power somewhat to control our remote control. So in a way, it's more interactive and we have a bit more agency over what we watch to the, you know, splintered, fragmented world of digital culture that's often referred to as convergence culture. And I think that convergence culture is a useful term, both because it draws all of these cultural media practices, whether they be traditional mediated medium, uh, sorry, traditional artistic forms that are specified in the enlightenment, like poetry, dance, architecture, theater, sculpture, or, or new ones like you know recorded music, recorded television, things like that. And it converges all of it within this weird little box and it breaks everything down into binary codes that we feel now entitled to have instant access to a sort of infinite smorgasbord of, of information and digital materials that we can then use as the raw materials in order to produce new things. Um, and for me, this convergence culture is very much misunderstood unless it's understood specifically as a server screen culture. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you are Pokemon Go fans or if you play Pokemon Go or if you know people who do. Uh, I was out of the country teaching for a summer and I can when Pokemon Go was released in the US and I came back and there were just all these people on the streets and the sidewalks and they're all walking around outside. And I thought it was this amazing moment where people had decided to like 
join community again and go out and breathe fresh air and, and be one with the trees and such. And then I realized none of them were actually interacting with each other and none of them were looking up from their screens. Uh, they were all like, they had all entered into this hybrid virtual real world where they were walking through real space in search of virtual things, which really boggled my mind just on a philosophical ontological level, but also, you know, raised to the level of really our streets, our sidewalks, nowhere is now removed from the ubiquitous reach of, of this server screen culture. And by server screen culture, I mean the, you know, the screen technology dependency that has not only is on our streets, it's in our classrooms, it is part and parcel of social and environmental justice movements and protest movements like Standing Rock. It is central to mainstream as well as, you know, more grassroots or youth generation oriented social media and the uh, attempts at environmental messaging. You know, all of this is reliant on this connection to what we call the Internet of Things, right? Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the Internet of Things, it's a loose term for basically the fact that just everything is connected now. So the internet of things refers to ways in which all aspects or many aspects of our daily you know, home life, as you see in the top left, our daily city life, as you see in the bottom right, or work life, and in the center, the sort of global connectedness of, of economies, of professions, of industries, of arts, of cultural practice, of communication. You know, all of this is reliant on the connectedness of this one giant digital organism, which itself is has a heartbeat that is completely produced or, or has long been produced through fossil fuels because coal is still largely used uh, to power energy grids. Um, if you look even at this, you know, this is a good graph that shows the number of devices connected to the Internet of Things. Uh, if you look at the change just from really like 2010, over the past 10 years, it's gone from under 10 billion devices to some 50 billion devices. And that was a projection for 2020. That's actually a really low number considering how much this is multiplied uh, because of the pandemic now that these are, seem to be the only way that we're actually uh, able to connect to anything. It's how I teach. It's how most many students learn. It's how a lot of people do their jobs. It's how most of us stay in touch with our friends and family. However, this internet of things is itself, of course, reliant on this entire um, cradle to cradle did, um, new world order of the of digital imperialism that flows from natural resource mining uh, and use up to greenhouse gas emissions and waste production. Again, all of this necessitates constant energy dependency and far from being in any way on a cloud somewhere or um, or or immaterial, this information is constantly flowing through fiber optic cables that are connecting and being stored in uh, server farms, right? And server farms are for the most part, just like the fiber optic cables underneath the water on the ocean floor, just like the satellites that are orbiting the earth, you know, they're kept out of the way. They're kept out of the way so that we don't see them. Um, and that's one, one large problem with our sensibility of a material or an environmental um, environmental impact and reality of this culture and of these devices is that they are kept out of the way. Um, and so I want to think about now sort of looping all of this back into the locality of this uh, of this particular group is that sometimes they're not kept out of the way. Um, some of you might actually be familiar with the uh, MI1 IBX data center in downtown Miami. Are y'all, you've seen this maybe driving on 95. Uh, you can actually see it. I mean, you can see in the map in the top right there. Can you see? You're not. You don't see my uh, windows, right? You can actually see the full map. We see the map that you have on on the slide. Okay, excellent. So, so yeah. So this is right in the middle of downtown Miami. It's really sad the amount of things that are marked as closed now on Google Maps. Um, 
the the NAP of the Americas or the network access point, as it's called, uh, or what which is what NAP stands for, is definitely not closed. It's very much open for business, and it's one of the handful of busiest. Sorry. You're trying to explain what it's. Uh, en français ou en anglais? I'm sorry. I I should I should have muted myself. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the NAP of the Americas is a, it's a, um, it's a network access point, which is basically a massive server warehouse where the internet comes together. And I have a, a friend and a colleague uh, who I'm doing some research on specifically the relationship to cable companies in Miami who wrote a book called The Undersea Network uh, and that came out in 2015. I highly recommend her name's Nicole Staroselsky. And it's a global study of these undersea cables and how they've changed the actual topography of land, how they've changed the topography of marine ecosystems, and how they've helped to shape and develop communities around the world really over the last century. And you can see here's another map uh, just at the top there is where the major cable comes in connecting Miami's AT&T hub uh, with the rest of the world. Going back to this, so this is this building um, is kind of where um, you know the internet is here <laughs> in Miami. As I said, it is one of the the biggest, uh, the largest, maybe the five largest internet hubs or data centers in the country, and it's extremely important because, as it says, it's of the Americas, meaning that it is the link between the U.S., the Caribbean, and South and Central America. And so this is actually the internet connection point of 148 different countries. It is built 32 feet above sea level rise with walls thick enough to withstand a Cat 5 hurricane. Some of the other data here or these other numbers refer to uh, the power redundancy of backup power that it has. In other words, it basically has twice the amount of power that it needs in order to run. It has twice the amount of server coolant than, than it needs should it have a power failure. Uh, and at the bottom, the PUE is actually the power use efficiency, which means that it is working, basically using almost twice the amount of energy that it, it needs to use to actually articulate uh, its energy or information and distribute its information. Um, and then you see the 17.5 uh, megawatts is the amount of energy that it uses. Uh, I'm trying to remember the number. It's something uh, like one megawatt hour powers about 330 houses. So multiply that number times 330 homes and that's about the amount of energy that's being used. Uh, and this is something that I would love to in the future, and maybe we can talk about it here, um, discuss its relationship to the Miami power grid, uh, ways in which it's actually getting the energy to do that, and what that type of energy, media infrastructure, and digital online dependency, uh, how that shapes uh, an entire geographical and, and localized communities relationship both to online connectedness, but also the environmental impacts of, of digital culture. And with that, I think I'm probably talked for about as much time as I was allotted. So it seems like a pretty good place to stop is to bring all of this back to Miami. And maybe this will provoke ways in which we can, you know, in the, the discussion, um, think about how this actually connects to to aspects of, of sea level rise or what happened, you know, this is what I find interesting is that it's built so far above, uh, above sea level. Um, I think the third floor is entirely reserved for federal government um, server use. And so there's all kinds of stuff going on in this building and all kinds of different ways in which it's connected to, you know, political economy, to uh, data control, but also again to the environmental uh, ramifications of, of digital culture. And with that, I open it up to, to questions or, or thoughts about ways in which this might perhaps be put in conversation with, with discussions of, um, of climate um, action, sea level rise, adjustments, uh, adaptation, things like that. 
Uh, anybody have any questions right now for Hunter? Thank you very much, Hunter. We really appreciate the talk, um, but I'm sure okay. I, I have a, if you just, I guess, just chime in. Uh, if you have a, a question, unmute yourself. I'll, I'll quiet now for a second. Um, I have a quick question before yeah. things start getting a bit more complex. Um, you mentioned the Journal of Environmental Media, and I did a quick Google on it, and uh, the results weren't, you know, it wasn't like, ah, the first one. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, what's a good way to reach that? Here, I will just go ahead and uh, throw the link into the chat. Thank you. I was actually going to ask you for that link later so we could put it on um, this meeting event page. That way, anybody who comes back to it can access yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, please do. So there's the link. And on the link, you can uh, access the different uh, issues. And so you should be able to. But let me. Here is, it's actually distributed digitally through um, in Ingenta Connect, which is an online journal bundler. Uh, so you can actually follow that link to get to where it's the issues are distributed online, which should be available through the other link as well. But this is where, uh, if you follow the bottom link, you should be able to actually pull up issue 1.2 and then the the free open access supplement um, for COVID-19, if that's what you're looking for specifically. Yeah, also, I just realized that it was actually right at the top there, but not what I expected it to look like. So. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Something, I don't know. I'll talk to Intellect's PR people about that and see if we can <laughs> snazz up the, uh, the marketing. Um, I see that Victor has a question for you, and uh, I'll just read it for him since it's in the chat. Oh. Uh, it says, just a simple question, what has the recent COVID crisis taught us about digital culture? What works, what didn't, or what doesn't? Hmm. Um, so I believe that the recent COVID crisis has taught us that we are capable of adjusting many aspects of daily life and sort of traditional social behavior and rituals to online practice, such as we're doing here, but such as we also see right now in these major uh, debates, both in education and health. Uh, you know, there's a lot of promise or there are lots of people who want to push right now for education to become far more remote and online oriented after all, of, after this is over, whatever that means, or whenever that happens, but also to shift a lot of health practices to help to telehealth, um, which in a way is good because some people uh, will have to commute less. Uh, some people have easier access to things like education and the few health things that can be offered through telehealth. Now, this I think that those points also drive home the fact that when talking about digital culture, uh, mainstream industries and especially popular cultural values in the US completely ignore the fact that there is this thing, uh, there is an aspect of digital culture that's lodged in communication racism. In other words, not everyone has the same access to digital screens. Not everyone has the same access to digital devices or to the same speed of, of uh, internet uh, information and data. Moreover, not everyone can learn in the same ways or receive health advice in the same ways. So not only is this playing into what's already a very profound socioeconomic and raced digital divide, um, which we is a term in using media and, and information studies, but it also completely ignores two major points. One of them is that digital information is not infinite, it's not free, and it's not immaterial. And secondly, digital experience, reading screens instead of actually interacting with people in person is a completely different ontological, social and psychological, sociological act, which means that it's constantly rewiring our brains in different ways. 
And the more time we spend on screens, the more reliant on them we are, the more acclimated we get to these, these mental or these, these, these brain wirings that are focused on a scan and scroll um, digestion of information that have become really good at micromanaging and multitasking, but have actually started to lose the built-in wiring that's connected to things like deep memory uh, construction or empathy. So we are literally by using screens instead of reading books or instead of interacting directly with people in real time where things are a little bit slower, where we have to be a little bit more mentally involved, we're actually going to train out of ourselves as individuals and as a species, these profound aspects of of ecocentric existence where, where we actually empathize and can care for, for other people and other things and the world around us in certain ways. So I, was, I think that the COVID crisis has taught us both that we are capable of scaling our existence to the virtual far more greatly than we've even experienced with the internet of things up to 2020. But it's also taught us that the process of doing that is going to ignore the environmental and social and psychological ramifications of that, which is horrific. Well, let me just follow up with that. I mean, you're, you're talking about that sort of social divide that comes from the provision of some of these things. I, my personal experiences that I, I had right before or at the beginning of the COVID epidemic upgraded my um, uh, internet connection from a DSL to a cable connection accidentally, fortunately, because I suddenly had three college students at home all doing their work. Mm -hmm. And there's no way I could have supported that. And I see that as an issue with everybody does everybody have enough bandwidth to do the work that they do? Does everybody have a a good enough smartphone to do the work they do. I personally can't see how you can park your car in Tony Coral Gables without a smartphone today. Yeah, no, I'm, I, it is really, really complicated. It's really difficult to park a car, but even, you know, beyond that, think about like the, the provisions uh, of the state and federal quarantine rules trying to keep people from, uh, keep indigenous First Nation people from protesting pipelines, saying that they're breaking quarantine rules. You can't pro physically protest a pipeline via Zoom. And so move shifting everything to the digital, you can't, you can't protest the police murder of black citizens on the street via Zoom in the same way you can in person. And by trying to shift these things to online, it's really a way of government control of democrat democratic activism and social protest, which I think has also become extremely both relevant but also amplified over the past few months in that, you know, there is just because most of us are existing online doesn't mean that there still isn't real suffering. And it doesn't mean that that real suffering isn't completely unequal in terms of racial class and, and gendered social groups or ethnic social groups. Um, I think that you know, digital culture allows us a sort of illusion that we all have the same access to the same agency, but that's not the reality. And it's also, not keeping people from walking around, you know, city streets with AK-47s and inciting violence. And that again is tied into those real problems of praxis and social inequality that don't answer to Zoom. You have another question here, and I, I think because of what time it is, we'll take one more question after I read this one, um, and then we'll probably stop it there. And then we, because we do have breakout sessions afterward for anyone who wants to join. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and read you this one. It says, this might've been mentioned as I was disconnected. I feel extremely fortunate that online exists and is efficient. Imagine if this pandemic had hit just 10 years ago. Are IT tech companies considering how to reduce their environmental impact? If so, how? And then 
what, if anything, can we do as individuals to reduce this particular impact, bearing in mind that we also need to reduce the environmental imp impact of our everyday lives. Perhaps we should just go live on a deserted island with a mountain to make our lives simpler. I, I think that that last thing is probably the best idea. Uh, unfortunately, in this country, health insurance is linked to employment. So if you go do that, they will either reject you at a hospital or you will leave with a seven figure bill. Um, there, there are two questions there. Uh, I think that the answer to what we can do is problematic. There are answers there. There are things we can do, but there's a major problem with putting the onus of this in the hands of the consumer and of the individual. There are things we can do as individuals and in that we can, for example, we can change Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu settings so that they don't automatically start the next episode. So that you know our server, so that our online consumption isn't just constantly streaming. We can close our computer sometimes. We can shut our maps and try to find our way somewhere we've been 30 times, but can't figure it out because we're so reliant on them. So there are ways in which we can, you know, we can take a day per week off screens. There are things we can do as individual people to actually combat that, but that's really just like the tiniest drop in the bucket or grain of sand on the beach. What we can do, as Xavier pointed out and is important, is that we can vote, you know, and we can support and use our vote to support uh, people who want to, you know, work, build a Green New Deal or to, uh, to propose, to initiate, and to pass legislation uh, towards more, not only towards more environmental uh, responsibility, but also towards accountability to corporations and corporate practice. You know, accountability to, to tech companies is a huge thing right now, and you can impact that from everything to protesting it online, to not ordering things from Amazon, to divesting if you have like a retirement account or stocks or anything by, by divesting your investments from companies that you think do bad things. Some of these companies are have been trying to reform uh, and whether that's to rebrand themselves or because they actually care, it doesn't really matter. The, the thing is that they're doing something. Uh, so I know that you know Apple and Google and have both pledged to go carbon neutral. They're building solar farms around their server farms to try to power the server, um, all of this through, through renew renewable energy. Um, I think there was actually, there was on April 1st, there was I think an Amazon social media blast that no, it was it was Google. It was a Google blast, holding, taking full accountability and responsibility for all of their role in climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, and pledging to completely change their practices. And it was an April Fool's joke that was staged by Extinction Rebellion, I believe. And it was really awesome, but it was also really sad because. I got really excited and thought it was a real thing. Um, and mean in the meantime, you know, companies like like Amazon is getting their their uh, share value, their profit margin is is soaring because they are exploiting the situation that we're all ordering things. But the people that deliver them are mostly you know working class people of color. Like they're all of the the um, the economic success of these major tech companies that rely on total connectedness are again connected to these labor problems. I'm not sure if y'all saw yesterday, but Amazon's posting basically for an information surveillance expert to help them uh, suss out which of their employees are enacting and participating in unionization. And they didn't even really like cover up that this was what they're hiring for because it's capitalism and that's okay. Um, so I think that, you know, holding companies accountable, holding elected officials and government accountable and being part of large cultural, you know, changes in cultural values and large grassroots movement to help change governance and to help change corporate accountability is, 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 is the best thing that we can do. Or yeah, go live on a deserted island with a mountain. How many are there? Are there enough for all of us? <laughs> thank you, Hunter. Yeah, yeah, thanks everyone for the, the questions. I have a quick question if we have a, a moment. Yeah, Molly. 
you mentioned a study about, I think about the fiber optic cables changing the topography. And I'm, you know, I'm aware that there's a digital divide societally, but I tend to forget that in my daily life that, you know, the internet has material aspects. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> it's just so sometimes hard for me to like think about. Um, can you tell us about the study or at least the name or something? Yeah, again, so it's uh, Nicole Staroselsky. I'll write it here. And the book is called The Undersea Network. And it's really, really fantastic. Um, I, we, talk about it, we talked about it a bit, I believe, in the, in the ECM program in terms of the materiality of, of, of digital culture. And so definitely, definitely check it out. Something like 77, between 70 and 80% of the global economy moves through fiber optic cables along the ocean floors. And these fiber optic cables were laid down there by tech companies, by communications corporations, in conjunction with local governments and international uh, agreements. And you can find all kinds of amazing footage and, and photographs online of scuba divers who are going down there now because they have to repair them, right? These are not permanent fixes. These are not permanent structures. And they are in the ocean, probably getting nibbled by fish and walked on by crustaceans and things like that. And they're gradually dilapidating and falling apart, which means, first of all, that they are just sort of loosing all kinds of glass, plastic, and, and metallic substances into the ocean. And also, you know, leaving at risk this digital infrastructure, which critique it as we may, we are also reliant uh, on it. But yeah, Nicole's book's awesome. Check it out. All right, I think that'll be it in terms of our questions. Hunter, thanks so much. You're awesome. It's been yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks. Time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for, for being here and the questions and the discussion. Great, thanks, thanks Hunter. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick thing before I, I have Brian uh, adjourn us and take us uh, uh, along with uh, Adam to the rooms. Um, Hunter, what you said about it's not, it shouldn't be on, um, you know, on the consumer alone. In fact, it is about societal change. And that's why I'm so adamant about us voting, because this is oh, yeah. how we do it. The, the homeowners association that we have here knows that it alone is not going to have a majority of members. We're not a one million member organization, but what we do have is through a, a sense of purpose, the ability to change the way our constituents think about who and why they're going to vote. So what we're trying to be through this organization is be agents of change. And it's, it's a process. It's not something like a marketing campaign. It's really us working together, getting to know each other, getting to understand the issues. Because of that, Brian and I had voice. When the Army Corps of Engineers wanted to do something, we could speak at, with authority about South Dade, and we could speak with authority about how climate gentrification will impact the areas that they're protecting, particularly uh, the, the lower income, high elevation communities in Miami. So there is a reason why we organize and, and work in what we do. So that's what we do in this team. It's about building community, building, uh, learning and working together, trying to problem solve, see around corners and do all those wonderful things. Our next um, speaker uh, is going to be uh, a pretty relevant one because we're still in, in a, in hurricane season. And if Adam, if you could put the link, it's uh, Dr. Brian Soden, who is a, a professor of atmosp atmospheric sciences over at the Rosenstiel School at the University of Miami. And his presentation and expertise is hurricanes and climate change and the impacts for South Florida. And uh, we really, really welcome uh, him to, to join us. So that's uh, October 7th at um, seven o'clock again online until we can get to meet in Victor's Railroad Museum. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you there. For now, um, let me turn it back to Brian and Adam who will uh, tell us about our chat rooms. Uh, again, on the chat room, I put a link. I'm sure everyone here is registered, but if you're not, how to get registered and a link uh, on how to get your absentee ballot. Uh, the reason I put that link is so you can copy it send it, put it in an email, and send it to all 
your friends so that everyone votes. The name of the game here is getting the vote out. Everyone's decided who they're going to vote for. So those with more ballots in the ballot box win. It's that simple. And everything, absolutely everything, the fate of South Florida, the fate of this nation depends on who's in charge. It's that simple. So please get the vote out. Uh, Adam and I will have an announcement for us. We're going to be doing something spectacular, we hope, in October as a way of trying to get the vote out through the underwater HOA. We're, we're dreaming and planning it, and uh, maybe uh, we'll talk a little bit about it in the sessions. Thanks, everyone. Brian? Um, okay, so I guess uh, now's the time. Thank, thank you to the, uh, Hunter and uh, again for, for a very interesting presentation where I think we all really opened uh, our eyes to some things that maybe we don't think about every day or at all and um yeah we appreciate that so now we're going to break up into a couple of groups um one kind of talking about where what sort of issues the the uh, underwater hoa will be addressing that'll be with me and then adam's going to talk uh, provide um then the Water HOA discussion is, is not going to be a directed one. It's really going to be what we what we kind of think as a group are some things that we might want to get engaged with more. So, yep. and um, if, if yeah, so just to, just to, just to interject, Brian. Um, I'm, I know I'm just seeing a couple of uh, comments saying they won't be able to make it. So for anyone who can't make it, thanks for coming, um, and we'll see you at the next meeting. The link to the next meeting is there and you the form is there. So if you want to go ahead and register now, that way you don't have to do it later, you can do that. Um, and unless there's any other questions from anyone who's going to leave, I'm going to go ahead and break us out into the breakout rooms um, and we'll see everybody there in a few seconds. All right, great. Okay, bye everyone.